I'm exploring one of the biggest and most ambitious engineering projects Europe has ever seen. Well, actually can't see, because it's happening two kilometers under the Alps. Boring the longest rail tunnel in the world involves some enormous industrial engineering using enormous machinery. But it also creates an enormous and rather messy problem. It's estimated that this project will generate 21 million cubic meters of rubble, which is hard to get your head around. Put it this way, that's enough to turn an area the size of Greater London into a gravel driveway one centimeter thick and still have enough left to do half of New York City. So what do they do with that amount of rubble? The answer is cut a massive cavern out of the rock and build the world's biggest purpose-made subterranean cement factory. This place is huge. Every day, hundreds of tons of rubble are transported along 40 kilometers of conveyor belt here to be turned into cement. This is a perfect piece of recycling. Excavate rock to make tunnels, bring those rocks to a processing plant underground, and turn it into concrete to line those tunnels. Everybody wins. But cement only uses 25% of all the rubble. So where does the rest go? To find out, I've been given a load of rubble, a massive truck, and a mission to go back up to the surface and get rid of it. I'm doing this on my own. There isn't a driver in here who's worried I might crash his truck. <laughs> there is. Uh, right, power. It works. Drive the big truck. <laughs> Ooh, this looks narrow. He's OK? He's all right? Are you sure? Every single day, a fleet of mega trucks like this one make 140 journeys up to the surface, carrying in total 3,500 tonnes of tunnel trash. That's rubbled the weight of a Statue of Liberty every week. There might be a whole series in this. Welcome, you just joined me on Underground Truckers. I'm hundreds of metres beneath the Alps. Everywhere. Along all of these tunnels down here, you see these huge plastic tubes. They're for ventilation. And there are pumps dotted about, pushing huge volumes of air down them. And it's a good job they are, because without that air, there wouldn't be enough oxygen down here to keep us alive. Oh, there it is. The light at the end of the tunnel. Dawn of a new day and the start of a new segment in this show. Left or right? This is the Podasta Valley, Austria. And right now, it's not looking its best, because it's currently the biggest dumping ground in all of Europe. Over half of all the rubble generated from this stretch of tunnel is being tipped here. And just look at it. What would Julie Andrews say? I'm hoping that my best friend Michael has got some answers. And this is where all the rubble comes? Yeah, all the material out of the tunnels will be stored here. And there's a lot of them? It's in total more than 7 million cubic metres of material. And you can't just dump it in a van? Exactly. It's not allowed to dump material. So if you can't just dump it, what do you do with enough tunnel rubbish to build seven Empire State buildings? Michael is a man with a very big plan. This natural V-shaped valley is slowly being transformed into a U-shape. The engineers are depositing rubble onto the valley floor in thin 60 centimeter compacted layers. It's going to take 10 years to build it up, landscape it, reroute rivers, and reintroduce native plants and wildlife. You're looking at the biggest garden makeover in history. 
Moving an entire pitch is a big enough engineering challenge. But here, they have to do it whilst manoeuvring around that massive musical instrument, the South Stand. The entire South Stand and all 17 and a half thousand people on it are supported on these trees, one here and one there, just two. And they're doing the job of what would otherwise be, I'm guessing, dozens of pillars. The net result is this clear, open space. And if you look at the top, you can see where each of the sort of fingers or branches off these trees are pulling in the weight and into this huge support. There is a downside to this. All of the weight is transferred into these supports and they go below there. Below there is exactly where they store the pitch. And that's why the pitch has to split into three parts to get around these two critical supports. So when the stadium is being used for American football, where exactly do they store three massive chunks of Premier League soccer field? Wayne will probably know. So this obviously is a car park. Is this the end of the pitch? Yeah, this is the end of the pitch. So when we go into transition, this is uh, the pitch's home, if you like. Well, so the pitch comes in here? Yeah, so basically we just um, remove these rubbers and then the pitch wheels obviously just run down that groove and in she comes. So that whole pitch into yeah. the car park. So if you hear announced in the stadium, will the owner of the beige Vauxhall, please, you better move Be it. Be quick. It's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna end up there. Yeah. So there's somebody who's you know, part of a team that you spend a lot of time looking after and maintaining that pitch, so it's beautiful. When it suddenly tears itself into three pieces and is bunged in the car park, that must be a weird moment. Hopefully it comes out the other end in uh, one piece. Wayne's beloved soccer field is about to be on the move. 48 hours from now, this won't be a soccer stadium, it'll be an NFL stadium with a completely different pitch and layer. They have practiced this process, breaking the pitch up, sliding under the south stand and making other transformations here, but they've never done it for real. This is their first live event. There are thousands of tasks to be completed. The atmosphere is already tense, but it's okay, because they've told me I can help. Be fine. I'm not just helping. Nick has told me that I'm about to drive a football pitch. You're all right to operate it, aren't you? Yeah, I've never crashed anything it's, in my life. It's easy. Hold down wireless command. Yes. And then you push that up. No, this will, this will be the biggest thing I've ever driven. In your life? Fast. This yes. is the first? It's also a football pitch. Yes. Is it? It's not the fastest. It's definitely the first football pitch I've ever driven. <laughs> yep. Oh, there it is. My first job is to move the pitch one and a half metres sideways tearing apart the three segments of field. That is a football pitch that is just split along its length on purpose. With a flick of my thumb, 68 electric motors begin to drive the pitch out of the stadium along the rails at a sedate seven metres per minute. So what we're doing now is you're doing 3,000 tonnes, and by the end of the day, you'd have moved 9,000 tonnes, which is more than the weight of the Eiffel Tower. Cool. All right. When you think about it and look at it without seeing it move, it's immensely complicated, but seeing it all happen... It's simple. There's a kind of simplicity to it. it. This type of engineering hasn't really changed in, in, in decades. It's just big moving stuff. It's always been mechanic. And a lot of toys. The first section is in the car park without a hitch, but I'm feeling a bit overconfident. Driving both at the same time. Um, am I moving now? No, that's moving. That's moving. I got... I, because it switched from that one to that one, I got complete... I very nearly fell over. Right, so that one's now moving. Yes. Yeah. It's like being a mole popping your head up in the middle of a lawn. <laughs> just standing here watching the other pitch reveal It's itself. quite deceptive, isn't it? Not just a pitch, either. It's another whole sort of culture. It's another world. The NFL is a yes. different world from what they play on here. Yes. That's remarkable. And the whole, the whole stadium is at a different... When you're down... It, it, feel it, it feels completely different. It really the does. The is... And the reason this is done is so that you can look into an NFL pitch. Yeah, it's a totally different place. It's taken just 25 minutes to roll away a grass field. But I have to admit, I'm a little concerned about Wayne. His pride and joy will spend the next 13 days in a car park. 
Well, we've got it in here safely. A couple of bits of it were rather nicely driven, but I don't want to, <laughs> don't want to bounce. I didn't see that bit. Damn. <laughs> How would you get off my bit? It's in safely. So going through the things that grass needs, it needs light because mm -hmm. it sits in sunlight, obviously. So we have the LED lights uh, in the ceiling. That basically maintains the photosynthetic activity within the plant during storage, but LED lights are slightly different light, so it doesn't stimulate too much growth, so we get a lot of type of growth when we have to mow so much. How do you mow it? We've got some autonomous robot mowers. So its needs can be met, it can be kept alive and nurtured. Are you going to be awake at night worrying? Um, yeah, obviously it's, it's a natural thing to worry about the pitch because obviously it's such a key thing to the business. Yeah. Uh, people often refer to it as our baby, which in general yeah. it is. We, we work on it every day. It's a seven day a week operation, three, six, five days. So we will be in on Christmas day regardless. And yeah, it's, it's really surreal because although you know the pitch splits until it actually splits, you know, like this morning, you know, you would never know. So to put it in here now, it's, you know, even for me, even surreal to look at. Yeah. So that's yeah. your pitch. <laughs> yeah. I've no doubt that when you roll this out again and present it to the world, it'll be healthy and hale and hearty and green <laughs> and brilliant and lush and wonderful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it will be, it will be. No pressure there. In just four and a half hours, Tottenham Stadium has swapped soccer for American football. There's a new pitch, an old new world. But it'll take more than a pitch switch to turn North London into California. You're looking at one of the biggest moving objects ever made. The Mary Maersk is a triple E-class cargo ship. Those E's stand for economy of scale, environmentally improved and energy efficient, which is actually four E's. So if we're not counting, I'll give them another one. Enormous. Nobody builds something this big, this complex, this expensive for bragging rights. That's what it's all about. I'm 200 feet above the water and all I can see of the ship are containers. Put them all on a train at once and it would stretch a staggering 70 miles long. The ship currently weighs over 250,000 tonnes, but only about 63,000 of them are actual ship. And I'm not just talking about the containers you can see, there are even more in the hold. The Mary Maersk carries its shipping containers stacked in columns, 23 across its width and 24 along its length. And because there's no deck, the containers can be piled up to 21 high. Right now, Joe is going to show me one empty section on board that'll be filled at the next stop in Rotterdam. <sighs> Joe, I don't think much of your stairs. Oh, my God. That is a huge... That'll be filled with cargo eventually. In the next port, we're going to go fully loaded. That's oh. the belly of the ship. I'm huge. <sighs> yeah, you're obviously used to steep stairs. Ah. So this is a hold. This is what the whole ship's about. In this cathedral-like space, we're actually more than 10 metres below sea level. This is an enormous building. And this is not the whole hold, is it? It's not all of it. No. And hang on, this isn't even full height, is it? Because I go up above... Double it. Oh, so double this in every direction. Basically, yeah. That direction, that direction, mm -hmm. and that... And you've mm -hmm. got one of 11 holds. Mm -hmm. It's... I honestly think my brain is struggling to get hold of how big it is. Fully loaded, this ship carries a whopping 18,000 containers. If they were placed end to end, they would reach all the way into space. It's kind of spooky. It is kind of spooky, and it can get spooky when you're sailing because of the wind and the waves. You get these noises that are unexplained, and a lot of the crew are superstitious. Oh, that's so proper maritime stuff. Yeah. So there's, there's a sort of a sense of it being a bit haunted and a bit... Yeah, yeah. I totally get that. Ugh. I would not like to be left here on my own with a torch with slightly fading batteries. By doing away with a deck and piling its containers high, the Mary Maersk is able to carry over 200,000 tonnes of cargo. 
But how can something that looks like it has the structural integrity of a giant bathtub be strong enough to survive the cyclones of the South China Seas? I've come to the ship's kitchen, whatever, to demonstrate something absolutely critical to ships like this, and I need this sandwich box. So, imagine this is a ship. That's its deck on top. It's pretty rigid, but for container ships like this, you can't have that deck. They need to put containers in there. So, here's one I prepared earlier, as this is now a food show, and as you can see, with no lid, it's all flexible. But when I say prepared earlier, I really did, because what I cut off was this bit. If we take the lid off our sandwich box, don't need that. With this bit on top, the rim, if you like, it's a lot more solid. It's a lot less flexible than without. And this bit here, it's called a torsion box. A torsion box is a reinforced rim, just like the rim on a bucket, a cardboard cup, or a sandwich box. Its purpose is to stop the ship from flexing. And on the Mary Maersk, it's so big, it doubles up as corridors that run along the length of the hull. Now that's simple science used in a big way. Massive container ships like the Mary Maersk carry 90% of all global trade. That means almost everything we buy has been on a ship like this. 